video games are pretty expensive. While you can debate for hours and hours about whether or not modern game prices are worth it, you can't deny that, unless you're playing mobile games, most children don't have the money needed to buy most titles. In the gaming industry, there's a bit of a spectrum when it comes to the cost of the games you play. The more expensive a game is, the harder it may be to gain and maintain a player base. This is especially important for games with multiplayer models, as without a player base, these games can't function as intended. $80 is the average price for a AAA game, and as the price goes up, so do the expectations. If you sell a game for $15, it isn't going to be held up to the same expectations of a game that costs $30, and that won't be held up to that of an $80 game. Unless your game happens to be a mascot horror, at which case you'll be ridiculed until the day you die, might as well start monetizing it. With that logic, I also believe that the price of a game can put people off from buying it, especially as AAA games have been having a worse and worse reputation over the last decade. But what happens when you make a game free to play? You usually get to see a sweet spot where the player has no expectations before going in, leading to easy satisfaction and maybe even leading to a more active player base, since there are more people playing. But of course, there's a major drawback. Multiplayer games need servers to run, and the more people connecting, the more expensive the servers get. These games need to make money somehow, and that's where we get into the art of monetizing free-to-play, or as I'll be calling it, free-to-pay. The games are readily accessible and easy to get into, but raw player numbers alone don't equate to financial success, so they usually have to include some form of monetization, whether it be gambling, microtransactions, an in-game shop, or a battle pass. But these are all just generalities. Let's take a look at a small sample of free-to-play titles to see what they're like how fulfilling they are as games, and how they might go about making money. For this video, I decided to look at as wide of a variety of games as possible. Okay, maybe not that wide of a variety. I've decided to divide the games I'll be looking at into categories, for the sake of simplicity. Ogre Chambers Deluxe and Heal and Hurt are two games I've never heard of, but they represent the smaller games trying to build a player base using the free-to-play model, similar to the kinds of games you'll find on platforms like Game Jolt or Itch.io. Then I also wanted to try out games that are a little more popular and commercially successful, Brawlhalla and Paladins. I've seen both of these games labeled as rip-offs of more popular, paid franchises. At least, before Overwatch 2 made the game go free-to-play itself. Speaking of, I want to take a look at Overwatch 2, to see what happens when a previously successful paid game goes free-to-play. Lastly, I have Fortnite, as I'd say it's the golden standard in terms of the free-to-play experience. I could talk about that one other popular free-to-play game that has the gambling, but I think I'd actually rather kill myself. So, on top of this Windows XP Bliss Hill wallpaper, we have our games nicely laid out. So let's get started. Ogre Chambers Deluxe is a game I wasn't expecting to like as much as I do. Obviously, it's no surprise that this wonderful little game came from itch.io, with the Deluxe Edition being available on Steam for free. This is a roguelike game, so to me it just gives Binding of Isaac vibes because I haven't played any other ones. Because roguelikes are randomized experiences, it allows for infinitely replayable gameplay, with the cost of having a more game-focused, less story-driven game. And while I usually like having a story in my games, I have to say that I also really enjoy these more retro-inspired titles. Although I will say it definitely felt weird playing Binding of Isaac for the first time, but I digress. The game itself reminds me of a cool math game by the name of Gravitus, where the player is tasked with landing a space shuttle while dealing with different types of gravity. Of course, the difference here is that you're instead dealing with the different types of enemies. Speaking of, there are five different enemies here, with each one having a different design with different attacks. This drill guy flies towards you and sends a bullet your way after it dies. These greenish-blue guys shoot bullets in random patterns. These eye things follow and shoot you. The spooky masks have a damaging barrier. And these weird diamond-shaped alien homing devices have extra health and shoot boomerang shots. 
Okay, very cool. But where's the ogre? As you clear waves, you get to upgrade your ship with simple buffs like stiffer controls, faster engine, higher range, better invincibility, homing shots, faster shots, more shots, higher shot rate. There are a lot of shooting upgrades. The neat thing here is that you can only choose between three of these at once, with only one being selectable before moving on to the next round. At the same time, as the rounds go by, the enemies get faster and stronger. More enemies spawn, and the level layouts get harder and harder, with these little red obstacles that you have to avoid or else you die. Speaking of the levels, where exactly are we? This looks a lot more like a sewer than a chamber. You can also unlock other ships after making it to level 20 with one, forcing you to get comfortable with what you have before giving you more options. Like this glass cannon ship, which can only take one hit instead of having hearts. Or this other ship, with bullets that don't shoot straight. Lastly, it's time to talk about the monetization. How does this game make money? Well, it's actually completely free. There's no in-game currency or gambling here. The only way to unlock things is by playing the game. However, the developers can make money through donations on itch.io, or you can pre-order their upcoming game. Overall, a very good starting point, although it's pretty easy to see that the games are only going to get more monetized from here. Generally, I'd say <laughs> is a pretty good game all around. Heal and Hurt is another pretty solid game. It's a simple Unity FPS with a fun divergence in the formula. In this game, you get to play as angels and skeletons in a free-for-all setting. And as the title says, you can both heal and hurt other players by switching the type of shots you fire. Skeletons are weak to healing, and the angels are weak to hurting. And if you're not careful, you might accidentally heal your enemy. There are also a number of different maps and weapons you can use, like snipers, shotguns, and rocket launchers, which you can use for different situations. However, there's one major roadblock that can stop you from being able to enjoy the game so easily. The servers work by having players open them up. This isn't necessarily a bad thing at first, but most players choose to open up private servers. So in order to play the game, you have to get your friends on so people don't leave. And even then, I wasn't able to join any other servers, even the ones that weren't private. Once again, the game is completely free to play, with no microtransactions or loot boxes. The only direct way to support the developers is to buy a $7 supporter pack DLC, which gives a special skin for your guns. You can also support them by buying their other games. Again, nothing greedy. So let's move up a tier to the more successful, higher played games. Brawlhalla is pretty okay. Being a platform fighter obviously means it's going to get heavily compared to Smash, in terms of both the amount of content and the gameplay itself. But while it shares a subgenre with other platform fighters, the gameplay is where it really becomes its own thing. Basically, it's a regular platform fighter, but weapons appear on the stage and they alter how the character you're playing works, allowing for different playstyles to fit the same character, like the spear versus the gun. And look, it's Rayman! There he goes. Brawlhalla is a much more popular game than the other two, so I don't think I really need to go into detail here. The key difference between Brawlhalla and a lot of the other platform fighters is the way it goes about monetization. Most of these games have a standard price tag, but here the game is free, with the option to either grind out a ton of coins to get characters from the shop or spend $30 for all the characters. Here's where every method of monetization you could possibly think of makes their grand entrance. In-game currency, loot boxes, daily rewards, skins, a battle pass. Everyone's here. Oh wait, wrong game. Overall, Brawlhalla is decent fun, and I get that they have to make money, but not gonna lie, it seems a little excessive to have all of these. Like, can you not get rid of the loot boxes? Paladins is a completely original video game like no other futuristic multiplayer game that might exist. While many might compare it to Overwatch for some completely unexplained reason, this game has horses and a battle pass. Remember guys, don't get it confused with Overwatch, a multiplayer FPS game that includes several classes where the main game mode is about capturing a point and moving a payload to an end goal. Oh wait, sorry, wrong footage. Something I really love about this game is its original cast of characters, like Androxus, the cool edgy character who does no damage, or Lex, who's only a little similar to Reaper. 
And of course, we can't forget about Victor. The thing that makes this guy stand out is that he has the ability to run, which makes him faster than a lot of the other characters. And he can even shoot a gun while aiming. Okay, so yeah, this game is just what happens when you play map libs with Overwatch. And horses. Well, the game's made a bit of an effort to diversify itself over the years. It's pretty obvious that most of its audience probably came from people who wanted to play Overwatch but couldn't afford it. And now that Overwatch 2 is out, I guess this game just doesn't need to exist. The monetization here is the same as Brawl Stars. Daily rewards so you can make the game a routine. Microtransactions, loot boxes, and a battle pass. Not gonna lie though, $8 for 30 tiers is kind of an L compared to other battle passes though. But hey, at least you can pimp out the border on the starting screen. Oh god, not XX Night Girl who has the, the special border. Now, Paladins only seems to be played by the people who want a power rush, as the player base here just seems to be less skilled on average compared to Overwatch. Speaking of Overwatch, seeing the game go free to play is a really interesting thing to see. Unlike a lot of people that were dunking on Overwatch 2 for not really being a sequel but more so an overhyped update, I had actually never played Overwatch before making this video. So my experience remains completely independent of whatever happens in Overwatch 1. With that you being said, you have my attention. 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 I think the game's alright. I'm not gonna go too crazy with my opinion of the game since it's Overwatch. If you want to see a detailed review, go to IGN. I'm sure they gave a real great one. So what makes this a profitable free-to-play game? Battle Pass. And an in-game shop where you can spend dollars for pixels. Pretty good, I'd say. At the very least, it doesn't require you to spend money before you unlock new characters. Instead, you have to play 150 matches. A long grind, but it's technically better than a forced paywall. Overwatch 1 used to have loot boxes as your way of getting cosmetics, but with so many heroes, I could only imagine how annoying it would be trying to get a skin for a character you actually like. Also, I didn't know where else to put this, but when I was playing a match with bots to unlock more game modes, there was a Mercy AI called Big Booty Fart, and that's funny because there's most definitely a lot of that on the internet uh, with this particular I can character. Explain. But you know what seems to be the most profitable thing for your game? Have an anime crossover. Apparently, hey as it everyone, seems that weave culture is ingraining itself into free-to-play titles, like people ingraining something else into Mercy Big Booty F- But speaking of anime... So, um, have you guys ever heard of, uh, Fortnite? Ah, yes. That game that made the Battle Royale genre even more popular than it already was. It also seems to be turning into the next Smash Bros, but for PvP shooter games. We've got reps from Rick and Morty, Dragon Ball, Naruto, The Walking Dead, Marvel, DC, Halo, God of War, Mr. Beast, SpongeBob SquarePants, Cory in the House. Okay, so some of those aren't actually in the game. But the fact you couldn't tell right away says a lot more than you might think. Fortnite's monetization is probably the least egregious out of all the big ones. Straight from the get-go, you aren't given a disadvantage for not spending money. A good player can hop onto a new account and have the same experience as someone who bought every skin in the game. It's the ideal way to make a free-to-play title. Everyone is equal. It's just that the people that spend money look cooler than you. However, I do have to knock off some points for kicking off the trend of including a battle pass. I don't know if Epic were the first ones to include one of these, or if they just popularized it, but either way, this cosmetic battle pass inadvertently led to worse pay-to-win ones in other games. However, that's more of a problem with the developers of that game than Epic's doing. So as you can see, free-to-play games take many forms. They can be super big games that have led the industry, or as small as little itch.io indie games. Free-to-play doesn't fall under one genre or setting. It's just a neat little term that can connect the most different of titles. As for the monetization of these games, don't play anything that gives you a disadvantage for not paying. That's kind of scummy behave here. As for microtransactions, they're usually really, really inefficient when it comes to how much money you're spending for how little you're actually getting. Even though I'd say Fortnite did a good job with this in general, as at least you're not spending money to get an unfair advantage, $20 for a skin is still a little absurd. 
They are just pixels after all. Buy four legendary skins and you've spent the price of a full game. Buy a few more and it's as much as a special edition. At least with battle passes you get more for less, but the quality of the rewards vary by game. Alright, that's all.